had a yogi bearism happen to me this week. You know his old saying, it's like deja vu all over again? Well, it's like deja vu all over again. I was at a study group with other clergy, and there was a younger Episcopal priest there. And he said, they warned us in seminary never preach on the Trinity. Thought, wow, at least one thing's consistent in seminary. They were telling us that when I was in seminary years ago. Don't preach on the twin Trinity. And there's good reason for that. There's not much about the Trinity in the uh, Scripture lessons. Uh, yeah, Jesus says, go baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, right. That's according to Matthew. And in keeping with the noble zone that I try to have in homiletics here, Jesus never said that. The formulation, the earliest formulation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we have in history uh, is right around the middle of the first century, around 150 or the second century. So that one's out. Then there's Paul. Paul kind of sounds like he's getting into Trinity, except if you read Paul's letter in Colossians, he talks about Christ being subjugated to the Father, which really doesn't fit the Trinitarian theology. And besides, he was a very radical monotheistic Jew. And he wouldn't, no, he wouldn't go with Trinity And then there's the whole doctrinal thing. You know, you can use apples and things like that to try to explain it. Even the three stooges, uh, that'll work sometimes. But I think I'm going to talk about the Trinity anyway. Because... The thing about the Trinity, in that first hymn, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity. And it doesn't talk about doctrine. It talks about the roaring wind, the flashing lightning. It talks the natural world that's all around us. Because the Celtic people really took to the idea of Trinity. They felt it in their bones. They looked out into the world and they saw Trinity everywhere. The thing is, a lot of people spend time trying to observe and pull apart and understand the doctrine without exploring the experience of Trinity. So I looked around and finally found somebody that wrote a little something back in 2005 called uh, Virtual Spiritual Formation. And this person wrote about the psychology of the Trinity. This is a little bit heavy, sorry. While human psychology begins in the bipolar realm of knowing, the essential work of spirituality carries humans beyond bipolar patterns and perceptions toward a union of and or reconciliation of opposites by the third an internal observer, whose development requires a process of differentiation that necessitates the acceptance of the opposite. Did y'all keep up with that? <laughs> That's kind of thick, right? Basically, what this author is talking about is it's natural for us human beings to approach our world with left and right, up and down, through opposites. We understand the world through opposites. And that can cause us problems because we can get into misunderstandings with each other if you think it's up, but I know it's down. See? See how that works. Uh, so how do we reconcile the opposites? And this author says it's through the third, the introduction through. And the third in the human psychology pulls in our spiritual dimension where we make the leap of paradox and realize that up and down are on a continuum. And if you hit in the middle of a continuum, where it's up, where it's down, they're reconciled in one. Let's see, should I read the rest of this? Well, just one more sentence. This is the path of mystics who seek union with the one. It is not union with an object or idea of one, 
which will in turn produce an other, but union with that, capital T that, which can only be a knowable one. Now that really is getting into rather deep spirituality that requires some training and other stuff. And probably the best way to get to that is through poetry. So on this Trinity Sunday, I'm going to appeal to a Muslim poet. I'm sure they would appreciate that. Uh, I don't know, they might. Um, and this is Ibn al-Arabi. And in this poem, he talks about reconciling opposites. And just for yourself, listen for the point in this poem when your ego starts screaming. Okay, because it's really going to be afraid when it gets to a certain point. And I've shared this with you before. This is from the Tarjuman al Ashwak of Israel Arabic. My longing sought the upland, and my affliction the lowland, so that I was between Najd and Tahama. They are two contraries that which cannot meet. Hence, my disunion will never be repaired. That's the natural state of humanity. Before we appeal to our higher spiritual nature, I feel like I'm at a place of disunion that cannot be repaired. What am I to do? What shall I devise? Guide me, O oh my censor. Do not affright me with blame. Sighs have risen aloft, and tears are pouring over my cheeks. The camels, foot sore from the journey, long for their homes and utter the plaintive cry of the frenzied lover. After they have gone, my life is naught but annihilation. Farewell to it and patience. Did your ego scream? Usually the ego really gets rattled at that point about annihilation. And farewell to my life. Farewell to patience. And Ibn Arabi writes this poem knowing that at the moment of annihilation, up's no longer up, down's no longer down, but they are unified. They're brought together. At the moment of annihilation, I become one. Just like in the Trinity, there's perfect community and the unknowable one. There, I gave it a shot. Even though I was warned, and evidently the warning still stands, don't talk about the Trinity. But look around the world. Open your Celtic heart. You'll see it. You'll feel it. If you do a little bit of work, the moment of annihilation will come. You will be it. 